Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Encounter, where we bring you face to face with the most inspiring leaders of our time. Today, I am honored to host S. Soma Sekar, fondly known as Soma, an Indian American tech executive whose journey started in Pondicherry and led to USA in the last three decades. Welcome, Soma. I am incredibly excited to host you today. Johnny, great to be here. First of all, congratulations on doing this show. Uh, seems like you've been getting some fantastic speakers and great conversations. Excited and thrilled to be here with you today to have this conversation. So before we get started, let me introduce you to my audience. With an illustrious 27-year career at Microsoft, where he rose from a software engineer to corporate vice president, Soma is a leader in tech innovation. His work at Microsoft has influenced millions of developers who build apps for Windows and the web even today. Soma led the developer division, DevDev, which shipped some of the most popular developer platforms and tools, including Visual Studio, VS Code, .NET, VSTS, and some of the popular programming languages like VB, C Sharp, TypeScript, etc. I had the privilege of being a part of his extended team at Microsoft India Development Center here in Hyderabad. Now a managing director at Medrona Venture Group, He's shaping the future of technology. Beyond tech, Soma is the co-owner of Seattle Sounders FC and Seattle Orcus, influencing the sports landscape in Seattle. Join us as we explore his vision for technology, venture capital, and sports. Soma, I've been uh, a huge fan of you even before I joined Microsoft because back in 1996, I boldly claimed that Visual Basic was my mother tongue. Uh, and it has totally transformed the face of app, de app development so much so that, uh, you know, we have seen products like Borland, Delphi, Power Builder, and Oracle Power Objects. All of them were inspired by Visual Basic. So I'm actually very interested as an XVB fan and an XVB developer uh, to know more about your experience of developing VB tooling and then integrating that with the Visual Studio family. That, that's a great question. It, it does bring back some fond memories, Johnny, when you talk about VB. Uh, and, and there is the VB6 uh, and before, and then there is the VB.net and after kind of thing, right? And uh, I, I remember back in the early days of VB, uh, one of the things that we'd been sort of talking about at Microsoft, and back then, remember, we are still talking about what I call client-server programming days, let alone like you know, pre-web and definitely you know, pre-cloud kind of thing, right? And, uh, and, and those days, one of the things, uh, you know this, like, you know, right from day one, Microsoft was all about saying, like, you know, hey, how can we build the power of software and make it available to everybody? And even then, we knew that, like, you know, hey, there's only so much any one company or any one organization is going to be able to do. The more we can enable the rest of the world to be able to both realize, understand, and use software to be able to solve wonderful problems, we thought, uh, was, was the way to go, right? Uh, but in the early days, like you know, we had like you know Fortran, we had C, C++, uh, assembly language, a bunch of these languages that people were using, and it always felt like you know, hey, you needed sort of like to understand rocket science before you could program, okay? And and we had sort of been fondly thinking about this inside the Microsoft context, saying, hey, what would it take to democratize programming, okay? Uh, in in some sense, like you know, the 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 catchphrase we would be used is like you know hey, even my mother should be able to program, right? Now, I can tell you that like VB probably didn't go all the way there, but VB was sort of the first, you know, sort of big step forward, I would say, both at the world at large, but more importantly for Microsoft to say, hey, we are going to bring together a programming language, a runtime, and a tooling environment together that really enables a broader set of people to be able to, or write programs. In fact, I'll tell you like an interesting anecdote. Okay, so this happened a few years after B VB came into existence. VB was was growing like you know wildfire. It was becoming very popular. A lot of people were excited about what VB could do for them. In fact, people started building a career and a lifestyle out of VB kind of thing. So it was fantastic to see all that. Okay, so when all this was happening, I had the opportunity to go to uh, uh, one of the universities at Texas to give a keynote to the computer science department. Okay, so I said, oh, yeah, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to go talk to the computer science students because these kids are going to be the next generation people. So I was excited and I went and gave the talk. And then the, the computer science head of department 
uh, said like, hey, you know, the faculty would like to have a smaller conversation, meaning a, in a smaller group environment, a conversation with you. Are you open? I said, sure, we'll talk about it. And I'll tell you, that was one of the toughest conversations I had. <laughs> and the reason was because a number of people in, in that smaller group were giving me immense amount of grief about how we can be doing, you know, coming out with languages like VB and, NA, and, and sort of literally in their words, hey, you're making it hard for computer science students to really learn programming. <laughs> VB sort of, you know, provides a level of abstraction. They don't really understand what is below that. And you can't do this. Like, you know, we are here trying to teach, you know, the fundamentals of computer science. And here you're coming on with programming languages like VP that just takes, you know, that ability away from people to have to learn everything deeper kind of thing, right? So um, all my point is, you, on the one hand, people are really, really, really excited that like, hey, it is the first step towards democratization of programming. On the other hand, some of the academic purists were unhappy because we were raising the abstraction level and making it easy for a broader set of people to be able to uh, get stuff done through programming, right? Now, fast forward to today, the world is like, you know, completely different, right? You know, from we've definitely come a long, long, long way from the VB days kind of thing. But I'll fondly remember VB as sort of a huge step forward for Microsoft in our quest to democratize programming and software development. Talking about VB, you know, I personally feel if only, if only Microsoft chose to open source VB6 before it became a part of common language infrastructure and CLR, I think it would have become the most preferred uh, language for data science and machine learning because I see a lot of similarities between Python and VB. In fact, VB was very well designed uh, to be the data science language or the language of machine learning. Uh, as someone who has seen the evolution and currently looking at these LLMs and Gen AI, I'm just curious to know your thoughts on this. Uh, th that's a great question, uh, you know, Johnny, and also it brings back memories about like, you know, uh, open source or not open source kind of thing. And I would say that like, you know, hey, you know, I think, you know, back then I used to say this, even now I would say this. I think our, when I say our, let me first tell you that it is like, you no, know, I'm still talking about like as if I'm, I'm at Microsoft, I'm no longer at Microsoft. <laughs> but but, but the, the, the view that we had while I was at Microsoft in the early days, okay, uh, on open source, I think I think I'd would, I would be the first to tell you, and I think the world will tell you, including a lot of people at Microsoft, that we probably were a little late to the game to both understand the power of open source, to embrace open source, and to really become a leader in open source kind of thing. Okay. Now the good news is, if you look at it today, uh, Microsoft is as good a company as any other company in terms of both embracing open source, using open source, as well as contributing back to the community. Okay. And I've always believed that you need a two-way street between a commercial organization, the open source community for it to really uh, have the kind of positive virtual cycle and value add that is possible. Okay. Today, Microsoft is there. But as you know, in the, in the nineties, that definitely wasn't the sort of the, the thesis or the, the outlook or the approach that we had. Okay. I would be the first to tell you that anytime you open source something and if it is a good piece of work and a good piece of what I call software, there will be a community that comes around for that. I think the, the kind of innovation that is possible is like, you know, is different. The longevity that that piece of technology or code base will have is higher, right? So in some sense, you could argue that like, you know, we missed out on those advantages for VB. Okay. Uh, till it became part of, you know, dot net and then dot net got open source later on kind of thing. Okay. Having said that, I'm one of those guys that don't believe in like, you know, hey, we can keep talking about what if and what then and what this and what that. Doesn't matter, right? VB had a very important role to play. And I'm so glad Microsoft did VB when it did VB. The world embraced VB when it did VB. Uh, and we all moved towards .NET and VB.NET and C Sharp and then, you know, JavaScript and TypeScript and every other language kind of thing. And there is a there is a role for Python today. I'm so glad that Python is open source. I'm glad that Python is sort of, you know, the default language, a lot of you know, machine learning and data science people are using kind of thing. Uh, you now we can go back and sort of or a, or, a, or a glass of beer talk about like, you know, hey, is this, uh, no, what would have happened here kind of thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad and I'm really glad that Microsoft actually came over to the right side of the house in terms of uh, open source. And it started even when I was there, like, you know, for example, you know, you mentioned in a Visual Studio Code earlier on, right? We decided that Visual Studio Code was going to be open source right from day one. I was very much in the company when we made a decision to say that we are going to open source.net, right? So I think, and I was glad to be part of like, you know, putting Microsoft in the right path towards open source. 
and it has only gone from strength to strength in the last you know eight years or so since I've left Microsoft. Got it. Got it. Uh, when when Microsoft transitioned from uh, VB six, the standalone the VB based uh, uh, virtual machine and the standalone VB product and integrating that with CLR. I'm not sure because social media was not so active, but we heard stories that the Visual Basic MVPs and the community took a march from Bellevue uh, to Redmond campus, asking them to retain Visual Basic and continue that as a standalone tool. How, how true is that? <laughs> I, I, I would say like, you know, it's one of those cases where it was a, a tough journey and a very tough decision for uh, Microsoft, okay? Because we had sort of come out with VB, VB2, VB3, 4, 5, VB6 had come out and VB6 was incredibly successful, okay? But the world was also moving fast. You know, we had Java coming out and we had to decide like, you know, hey, what are we going to do? Are we going to embrace Java or do we need to do something different, but but give similar capabilities to the world, to the developers, to the programmers kind of thing. And, and, and as you know, a lot of it is history, but like you know, we came out with .NET and we had to make a decision, right? And for a long, long time, the one decision that we weren't sure of and we were going back and forth was how, how important was it to maintain VB6 compatibility? Okay. And we knew that if we maintain, if VB6 compatibility was a top order priority, then we knew we wouldn't really make the switch to .NET, at least for VB in a way that gets you all the benefits of managed code and sort of, you know, managed language runtime kind of thing. We just couldn't do that. Okay. I remember like, you know, one of the, one of the technical fellows that, uh, at Microsoft who was there at Microsoft for a long time, Brad Lovering, uh, he was working on this particular problem and the kind of debates and the discussions and sort of trade-offs and like, you know, people being on different ends of the spectrum on deciding whether like, you know, Hey, compatibility or like move to the new world and still try to preserve as much of the VP goodness as possible. Right. And I think the thing that, that I think we knew that was going to cause a lot of pain to people, no matter what decision we make, because for some, it may be like, Hey, compatibility is good, but there would have been a short term gain. And as the world moved on, the VB crowd would have been left behind and behind and behind. Okay. So, but if you take a long term view in the short term, the people who sort of bet their lives, bet their careers on VB had to come back to a learning curve to learn something new. And they didn't, some of them di just didn't want to do that. Some of them were sort of grudgingly willing to do that. And so it, it was a very, what I call tough, emotional decision. Uh, and we didn't take it lightly, but we knew that no matter which direction we took, some people were going to be excited and some people were not going to be excited. And we worked really hard to figure out how best, once we made the decision that we could bring as many people over as possible to be with us on the journey longer term, as opposed to being left behind. Absolutely. I was very much a part of uh, that transition from classic traditional Visual Basic to VB.NET. And I, I remember how difficult it was to convince developers. So, right. and, so and, and the thing I, the, I'll tell you one more realization I had then, right? You know, sometimes we sit and make technology decisions because we think like, you know, hey, this technology is going to be better and the technology is going to be better. But, 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 but it is Im imperative that we remember there is a whole lot of people out there who take a bet on your technology, who are sort of, you know, relying on your technology day in and day out for their family, for their lifestyle, for whatever they are doing. And you have to, you, you need to realize that you have that responsibility when you make the decision. Doesn't mean you're going to make decisions that's going to be uh, satisfying to people all the time, always kind of thing. But you need to understand that you have the responsibility and be thoughtful about what decisions you make and when you make and how you make those decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so that was very nostalgic uh, as, as, as a VB developer, passionate VB developer and a part of DPE back then, I, sure. I, I had the firsthand experience of going through this. So uh, moving forward, uh, so much developers were delighted with IntelliSense feature when it got shipped with Visual Studio. Again, it started with Visual Basic where you could type a, a class and put a dot and it would show the methods and properties, which was magical. And then it got extended to Visual Interday, Visual C++, and it became a part of Visual Studio. Now, uh, I, I, obviously, a lot of professors and lecturers were very upset with that because it abstracted and took programming to the next level with auto code completion. Now, fast forward to 2023, we have GitHub Copilot and Copilot X. 
you know, that not only write code, but you can right click and say, hey, deploy this to terminal. And it actually goes ahead and packages and deploys your code. So as someone uh, who literally led this developer tools and platforms revolution, what do you think is the future of programming in the context of generative AI and foundation models? You know, the, the first thing, again, like that comes to my mind is this journey. We used to have this phrase uh, inside DevDev, right? You know, our goal is to is to is to do everything possible to let you, the developer, have to write only that line of code that only you can do, you can write. And we want to be able to do everything else for you. Okay. Now we didn't have generative AI technologies back then. We didn't have all the cool whiz bang thing that exists today, kind of thing, right? So our 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 whole rationale behind coming up with intelligence and auto code completion and other things is to say like, you know, hey, if there is a way we can help you and help you me be more productive, then we are going to do that. Okay. And that's what, you know, you know, kicked us off in the intelligence sort of, you know, direction way back when we did that. Okay. Now you look at today, like, you know, like you said, like, you know, auto, uh, no, sorry, um, GitHub Copilot, you know, depending you on who you talk to, People will tell you anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of your code can automatically be generated by copilot. Okay. Now the question always is like, you know, why only 30 percent? Why only 45 percent? Why only 60 percent? Why not 70? Why not 80? Why not 90? Why not 99? Why not 100? Some take kind of thing, right? And 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 it's really about it's not about like, you know, hey, we don't want you to learn what it means to program, but it's about like, you know, hey, we want you to fo focus on doing things that only you are uniquely capable of doing as opposed to you having to reinvent the wheel 100 times because the system is inefficient in the process, okay? Now, the reality is when somebody says, like, you know, when, when Microsoft says, for example, like, you know, hey, we got customers telling us that 60% of the code that somebody needs to be writing is being automatically done by Copilot, that means automatically the next question is, like, you know, hey, does it mean I don't need 60% of my programmers anymore, okay? My view is a little different on that, okay? The amount of code that is getting built in the world today uh, is exponentially higher than what it used to be even five years ago. Okay, because the world is relying on technology. The world is, you know, is, is revolves around technology kind of thing, right? Every company is a technology company. We've heard that. Okay, so in that world, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the developers that you have are highly, highly, highly productive and are able to solve more complex and complicated and like you know amazing problems for you to be able to drive your business forward. Okay, and I wouldn't be wanting to waste your developer's time on writing code that could be automated. Okay, so in my mind, I'm I'm all about saying like, hey, if this means there is a let's say a twenty percent productivity in in your organization, okay, and you got hundred developers, okay, that means think about what twenty developers can do more for you, and go figure out how to move the ball forward faster, better in the process, kind of thing, right? Uh, so to me, like an automation al al always means on the one hand. Hey, I'm going to make it easier for people. That means like I need fewer people to do what I was doing yesterday, but I need to be doing more today. So let's figure out with the resources that I have, how do I best deploy them and use them and have them be productive so that I can continue running as well as I can. So, but, that is, only, but that is only the the part about Git, uh, sorry, uh, GitHub Copilot is it's on code generation or code writing. But like, you know, when you think about software, there's all kinds of things that need to happen, right? You need to plan, you need to design, you need to write code, you need to test code, you need to think about security, you need to think about reliability, and then you need to think about project management, right? Whether your software project is coming together well or not. And AI can be applied to each and every part of that software development lifecycle, right? We are talking about Copilot, which is fantastic when you're writing code, but there are other things that go in, in sort of making a software project come to life and come to success and come to existence, right? And I fully see AI playing a major role in every step of the software development process that's going to only be beneficial for the world of software development. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, as you said, code is only one part or one side of the story. There is so much else that needs to be done. And there is enough opportunity and enough toil that we still need to go through to make it uh, work. Uh, very, very well said. So Soma, uh, now switching the context to the the most familiar battle of our times, you know, open source versus proprietary. Uh, <laughs> we have seen it all. But 
interestingly, uh, with, with foundation models and generative AI, it looks like it is coming back all the way all over again. You know, for example, today, when you look at the Gen AI landscape, uh, we have three different types of uh, models. One is completely opaque, API driven, second are restrictive uh, that prevent you from using it for commercial use. And then there are completely open source. So this reminds us of those days of you know Linux versus Windows, Eclipse versus Visual Studio, and more recently Android versus iPhone. So what do you think uh, is the future of foundation models and what are your thoughts on this? The, I think the good news is like, you know, if you, if you pay attention to history, you know there is room for both, right? right? Uh, you know, Windows and Linux continue to be sort of, you know, meaningfully used in the world, okay? You look at the Android and iOS, there's like sort of, you know, room for both to, to get to some massive scale and still coexist with each other, right? Uh, so open source and uh, proprietary, you know, can be sort of, you know, competing, but there is room for both, right? When we talk about large language models, Okay, particularly in the generative AI context, right? Uh, you have like, you know, open AI on the one hand, which is mostly like sort of, you know, proprietary and API driven. You got a whole bunch of, you know, open source models that are coming together. Now, granted, I think like, like most things, I think the, the proprietary world starts off a little earlier than the open source world, gets a little more traction in the open source world, but the open source world through sheer sort of, you know, weight of the community and the breadth and depth of the community and what is possible will catch up and sooner or later there'll be like you know two uh great uh, what i call alternatives for people to choose from right that's what we see in the world of large language models there is a separate question johnny here which is hey how many large language models does the world need okay do we really need like you know thousands and ten thousands and hundred thousands and millions of models or is it going to be like you know tens of models what do we think the world needs in terms of large language model? And particularly today, the cost of, you know, using and you know, training a large language model and get it to some level of scale, there is a fair amount of resources required. Okay. Part of the reason why the open source is a little behind is because like, you know, those resources don't come in naturally unless you are in a commercial environment kind of thing. It takes time. It takes, you know, energy to get those resources and that kind of training set available, training data available to be able to, you know, uh, train open source models, okay? But, 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 but you take a step back, there is room for both, okay? And people are going to self-select whether they want to go use a proprietary model or open source model, or what we see, see more and more is people want a mocktail, okay? They don't really want like, you know, a particular drink. They are saying like, you know, hey, I want a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this, because depending on the use case, I have to think about price and performance. Okay, some queries, I don't really care about anything else. I need a blinding fast response. Some queries or some use cases, maybe it's okay to sort of, you know, be a little slower, but I'm also going to pay a tenth of the cost, right? So when you think about cost and performance, people really want a, a, a plethora of choice and they are not religious today about like, you know, hey, I'll go only with propriety or I'll go only with open source. Their view is like, I want to go with whatever is going to satisfy my requirement the most. And if it means I'm going to use this for this and that for this, then I'm going to go do that, right? So I think there is a world for both, but I'm so glad that there is a proprietary world that is moving as fast as possible. And the open source world is coming out very, very, very strongly here in the large language model uh, situation. Absolutely. We are, uh, we are in very interesting times, you know, looking at Open Llama and some of the work that the Middle East is doing uh, are very, very interesting. And uh, the innovation is coming from the most unexpected quarters. Uh, and, and this is what we need in the ecosystem. Fantastic. Absolutely. And it is so, not related to just open air or anything like that. In fact, I keep wondering like, you know, hey, when am I going to see some large language models that sort of get trained with all the different, you know, languages in India that's going to come out, right? Because there's no reason why there are large language models that get trained with like, you know, the, the 20, 30 odd dialects that we have in India and be able to like, you know, be useful for all kinds of people as opposed to just English speaking people kind of thing, right? So, you know, you think about uniqueness of data, it exists in every part of the world. You know, large language models can be sort of, you know, trained in any part of the world, right? So I think you're going to see a tremendous of in amount of innovation happening in large language models around the world. 
Absolutely. So when Sam Altman was here last week, yeah. uh, he ruffled yeah. some feathers by saying uh, India cannot build another LLM and that ruffled some some feathers and upset some people. So uh, as I said, I strongly believe, you know, we have enough data uh, like, you know, training an LLM on Tirukkural or Bhagavad Gita yeah. and com- coming out with uh, an India specific LLM. We have tremendous opportunity there. So, uh, so I, switching I been, gears. And, and, and in fact, I think like, you know, I think, you know, I actually don't know what context Sam said that, but Sam sort of, you know, I, I would, you know, uh, for a guy running OpenAI, I'm sure he has to say that OpenAI is going to be the one that builds the, the latest and greatest and the best models kind of thing. But I do agree with you that there is a tremendous amount of unique data that India has, and we should be thinking about how do we take advantage of the data and how do we train the models that matter with the data so that we got a best in class, you know, a large language model experience for what we want to build and do with the Indian context in mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we are looking forward to it. So switching gates, uh, uh, so my, your passion for developer tools, developer productivity is very clearly evident in the investments you made. Uh, some of some of those companies are developing tools like by developers like us. So, you know, whether it is Pulumi or Fixie or OctoML, uh, they all seem to be motivated by your passion for developer tools. Uh, so tell us about uh, Medrona Ventures and what factors do you look for when you're investing in an early stage startup? Got it. The, the, the first thing I would say is like, you know, the reason why I got excited about the developer audience at Microsoft and why I continue remaining excited about the developer audience is, you know, all kind of people create software and all kind of people consume software. Okay. The power as far as like software development goes is more and more in the hands of the developer. Okay. They get to decide what they're going to use, what they're going to build and how they're going to shape the world. And everybody else is sort of, you know, in support of the developers. Okay. So if we have a technology or a tool or a platform or a, or a company that is sort of targeting the developer audience and their customer base, I feel like, you know, that's the center of the universe. Okay. And that's why I was excited to sort of when I was running dev, dev at, uh, developer division at Microsoft and why I'm continuing to be excited about investing in a, in a class of companies that are more focused on the developer audience. Now, to be fair, the world is larger than any one audience. So I've got, you know, investments that focus on infrastructure, that focus on SaaS and everything in between, including like, you know, AI and ML and intelligent applications. But my love for the developer audience continues to be there because I feel like, you know, hey, that's the, most important audience and the other good news is that audience is only expanding in scale right you now have all kinds of low code development in fact like the person who's you know putting a prompt in front of chat gpd would you call them a developer or not like you know the the lines are blurring in terms of what it means to be able to use the power of technology and the power of software to solve a problem that you need solved right and more and more people are able to do it by themselves as opposed to waiting for somebody who's graduating from MIT to be able to spend six months and write something for them, right? So to me, that world is expanding and they are the ones who are sort of using technology in fundamentally different ways that are going to solve the world's most important problems. And so I'm excited to sort of play in that space. Having said that, at, at Metrona right now, to, to give you a brief uh, background on Metrona, we've been around for about 28 years now, okay? It so happened, and I would say, you know, some of it is providence and some of it is luck and some of it is like, you know, the people being at the right time at the right place. One of our very, very first investments was in a company that wanted to sell books on the internet. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and at that time, none of us knew that Amazon was going to turn to be the juggernaut that it is today. But one of the founders of Medrana ended up investing in, in Amazon. And there was no better way for us to get started in the venture capital business than like, you know, being part of a company like that. Okay. But having said that, there is 28 years ago, we moved forward a lot. Today, I would say like, you know, we, we invest in what we call early stage technology companies and early growth or mid stage technology companies. So seed and series A, we invest out of one fund and then B and C stage companies out of another fund. So we have two different funds that we deploy out of. Okay. And, uh, we, uh, and there are, we have a core set of investment thesis, right? whether it is the cloud infrastructure, whether it is like, you know, uh, AI and ML and the next generation of intelligent applications and generative AI, or whether it is SaaS, we have a sort of a, a variety of, you know, investment themes that we focus on. And we want to go find the best entrepreneurs and the best companies to be a part of the journey and be there for the long term. 
because we invest in very early stage companies, you ask me this question like, you know, hey, what do you guys look for when you make an investment? And I think, okay, I would say for me, it starts with the team. And the team could mean usually like one founder or two founders or a couple people and maybe a slide deck in the best case, right? Because that's all you have when you are in the very early days of a company, right? So for us, the team is really, really, really an important part of our decision making. Then the second thing that we look at is like, now, hey, what is the problem that these uh, this team is looking to solve? Okay, is this a is this first of all an important problem that the world is waiting on a solution for? And is the solution that these guys are thinking about building going to be at least 10x better than anything else that is out there? Okay. Then the third thing is like, you know, hey, is the opportunity space you know large enough for us to build a meaningfully large company? And is this the team that we think is going to take us home on that? You know, there is always the, the other question that we think about in this context is like, you know, why now? Why was it it's all five years ago? And why do we think it's not too early? And I'll give you an example, right? If you think about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, we took a bet on that being a big platform shift about six, seven years ago, as much as the rest of the world. And it took us about two years to realize that like, you know, hey, this one might be a little too early for us to get the commercial kind of success that we want. Okay. So we were in that particular case, a little too early to the market. We still believe that that's going to be a fundamental platform shift that the world is going to see. Is it going to be in 2023, 2025, 2027? I have no idea, but it definitely wasn't in 2016 or 2017. Right. So sometimes we could be wrong. Okay. But we need to have a, 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 a ability to say, hey, we can look around the corner and know that this is where a lot of disruptive innovation is going to happen. This is why this is the right time for that. And this is the right team for that particular problem. And if the answer to all those things is like, you know, yes, then we absolutely say we want to be a part of it and we invest in that. Perfect. So those those startups or potential startups watching this show, you know what to pitch and how to package it to impress yeah. Soma. <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, so Soma, you're also a huge fan of sports. Uh, apart from your interest in uh, Seattle Sounders uh, football club, you partnered with your ex-colleagues like Satya Nadella, Sanjay Pardasaradi and others to launch Seattle Orcus Major League, uh, a, a cricket league in US. So when can we expect to see the first tournament and would that be on the scale of IPL? <laughs> I think that's a great question, Johnny. Uh, first of all, like, you know, if, if you take a step back, like, you know, in my opinion, like, you know, different people think about, like, you know, how they want to spend their time and what they want to do in terms of giving back to the community. One thing that, you know, Akila, my wife and I sort of are excited about is how do we, how do we, uh, it, you know, how do we think about both participating in the community and giving back to the community? And we've sort of picked among a couple of things, uh, sports as one thing. Because like, you know, right from like, you know, when you are a kid, you are excited about sports. You want to be playing in sports. You want to, some of, some of, some kids have aspirations to be a professional player. Some people are, have aspirations to play, you know, in sort of what I call club level. And some people are excited about watching. Families are excited to come together and watch it. So there's a lot of community building and community activity that goes into sports, right? And the reason why we got excited to want to be involved both with uh, uh, Seattle Sounders, okay? And now with Seattle Orcas is because the two most watched sports in the world or the two most loved sports in the world are respectively soccer and uh, cricket. And so like uh, our kids grew up like, you know, playing soccer at school and that got us a little more excited about soccer. And we said, okay, when we got the opportunity, we said we'll be part of the Sounders franchise in Seattle. But cricket, in addition to like it being the one of the you know, most popular sports in the world, you know this, Johnny, like, you know, I was born and brought up in India and you literally grew up with the sport, right? Whether you play or you don't play, uh, you have no choice but to grow with the sport. And I grew up with the sport. And so that sport has been with me all through these years kind of thing. And when the IPL came out in what now, probably 11, 12 years ago kind of thing, right? Uh, the way, the fact that you can have a, a three to four hour game, okay? That's a, what I call a, a fast paced game. That is a, a great community uh, activity for the family to come together and watch and spend an afternoon or an evening too. I thought it was a fantastic idea. And when IPL started, it wasn't clear where, where it was going kind of thing. But in a year or two, it was clear that like, hey, there is, there is a lot of demand for this. And so about five years ago, 
uh, a bunch of us started thinking about like you know hey is this you know we first of all cricket is the sport that has been played in the us for a long time now okay in fact i'll, I'll ask you this question and see how whether you can answer this question how many cricket teams do you think exist in seattle today wow if you are I, oh, what is that i i don't have i don't have an answer i i have no clue but uh, i'm sure there are a lot of cricket fans uh, particularly coming from india and working at microsoft forming their own small little groups teams and playing tourneys so so there uh, are there are leagues in seattle now that together comprise about 250 cricket teams oh wow wow and, and these are these are people regularly playing every weekend or every other weekend and like you know going and competing i can see these are all what i call uh, not professional but people who are passionate about cricket and are and, and the other interesting thing i should call out is there are probably about 35 to 40 women's only cricket teams in seattle oh wow okay so at the grassroots level there is a lot of interest now if you go to a, a public school in the us you're not going to see sp- cricket as a sport yet so it mm-hmm. hasn't permeated in my mind into mainstream but just from a diaspora perspective like you know people from south asia or england or australia or any other cricket loving or cricket playing countries that are in the us they got tremendous amount of passion and that number is getting into tens of millions of people now okay so it's a meaningfully large number okay uh, so 5 years ago we started thinking about like hey wouldn't it be nice to bring a t20 cricket format and a league into this country okay uh, because we are seeing a lot of grassroots in adoption uh we are seeing like you know millions of households watching cricket games okay tuning into willow or tv or some other sort of you know broadcast channel to watch tv kind of or to watch cricket kind of thing and and you see the emergence of what i call people just wanting to play cricket and more importantly thinking about like you know, hey what are the opportunities for their kids to get to learn the game right from a young age right you see all of these kind of thing so we felt like you know, hey this was the right time for us to figure out how we can bring this sport Uh, in a little more in a programmatic way in this country okay the pandemic happened in between okay in some sense there was a blessing in this guys because that gave us the opportunity to say like you know, hey let's do more effort at the ground at the grassroots level for example today you have like you know probably 30 or 40 cricket academies in the country okay we wow. started the minor league or the minor league got started about two years three years ago now they've already played two seasons and there are 26 teams across the united states that are part of the minor league including seattle having their own team in fact the seattle mm-hmm. team won the minor league championship last year in the us okay <laughs> and and those are all sort of you know you now have under 9 under 11 under 13 under 15 under 17 under 19 kind of leagues in in the us you got the minor league you got cricket academies that people can send their kids to to learn so you are building all the building blocks and we are finally excited to say that the major league cricket or the t20 league is coming into existence this year okay in fact the, we just announced yesterday that so this is in some sense you could argue ahead of the presses the first game is going to be on july 13th in dallas okay oh, so wow. this season is going to be a short season and that's about two and a half weeks or so it starts on july 13th and ends end of july and there are six teams in the country that are going to be part of this major league right you got a team in seattle which is the seattle orcas team you got a team in san francisco you got a team in la you got a team in dallas you have a team in dc and you have a team in new york so we are we are putting up six teams and saying like you know hey the league season 1 is starting this year and we are excited to see how this hopefully is the beginning of why cricket is going to be a mainstream sport in the us in the years and decades to come excellent so wishing all the best to seattle orcas and uh, uh, again as an ex mike softy and visual studio developer i remember orcas being code name of one of the visual studio yes, releases absolutely <laughs> i remember that <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> fantastic so my you you inspired so many lives you actually inspired me directly to be a part of microsoft and be a part of the developer division and i uh, you are continuing to inspire uh, so many Techno- technologists across the world uh, through your investments in startup and now in sports uh, thanks so much for all the great work that you have done and i i continue to stay in touch with you following up on your work and having another discussion very soon thank you so much for for being a part of my show absolutely jani again it's a it's a pleasure to be here thank you for having me at the show and i do want to thank all the audience who are making your show a successful show and keep up the great work that you're doing not just through the show but everything that you are doing for the technology industry hats off to you and congratulations
Thank you.